assignments. Uh, the major issue I would say uh, in, in the assignments that as much as I uh, have seen uh, was the problem of that uh, you didn't check or you didn't follow the instructions that I had shared with you in the toolbox uh, tool actually the tool the document I shared with you uh, separately separate to the uh, slide deck uh, printouts or handouts I shared also another document PDF document related to the assumption mapping tool uh, and especially uh, the most important part of this uh, the assignment was related to the visualization of the assumptions mapping of the assumptions which is a visualization exercise and you had to do it through visualization actually i you had to share uh, with me your visualized or your your actually your map of assumptions with me uh, a lot of you had forgotten to do that or have missed to do that so i would suggest to consider that the usually we have a kind of instruction there so please uh, consider the instruction do it you do your exercise based on the instructions and one of the major issues also I came across was the issue of the how you are going to define your experimentation. Uh, as you remember, we started with the assumption statement, then we uh, transformed the, the uh, assumption statement into a hypothesis statement, and then on a third uh, iteration, uh, we transform the hypothesis statement into a experimentation plan. Let's by telling that how you are going to prove or uh, prove or validate your assumption or your hypothesis now through a line of quantitative or qualitative qualitative uh, research. Uh, the major issue that I confront in your exercises was that you usually uh, did your exercise telling that we are going to uh, validate this idea if the majority of our interviewees are going to accept this or re reject this. Majority doesn't make sense in a, an ex experimentation because you could uh, let's say imagine that that majority is just 51 percent of 100 people you are going to interview or it could be also 90 percent of 100 people 90 uh, out of 100 people you are going to interview so please consider that it will be much more helpful if you define a little bit more more accurately your uh, the number of the people uh, who are going to uh, valid uh, 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 let's say approve or disapprove your uh, the, your shared problem or question actually that's very much important in such a exer such an exercise do you have any question related to previous exercise or assignment? Any question? Actually, yes, I have one question. Can I? Yes, please, Nelly. Uh, uh, okay, uh, when doing the exercise, we came across to uh, such a dilemma like, uh, we uh, found out that all the points that we, all the assumptions that we made um, seemed uh, important for us. <laughs> so uh, the, it, we, we, did, we didn't have any important assumptions. 
Is it okay? Or... No, it is okay. It is okay because sometimes, uh, in a sense, it is completely okay because uh, if you have another assumptions that it is, uh, they are known and they are non-important, usually it shows that you are on a wrong path. But if it is uh, all of them are important and also they need to be validated, it seems that you are in, on the right track. Yeah, that's very much important. But please consider that this exercise is basically uh, a, a kind of uh, method to articulate what you have in your mind as an assumption. It could be something uh, uh, completely uh, related to, to your problem or uh, even uh, not directly related to your problem, but you should have to consider all the di you have to approach your problem from different directions in order to understand what sort kinds of uh, assumptions could you have mm -hmm. for a problem. That's very much important. And yes, you are right. It usually happens, uh, and it doesn't uh, show that you are on the wrong track. It's completely normal, actually, I, I would say. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Yeah, uh, hello, hello, Nesda. This is Fisher. Uh, I had a bit Fisher, of problem. Fisher, I'm early. Yes, 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 please. Yeah, I had a bit you. of problem. I had a bit of problem doing the visual exercise. Uh, so uh, uh, even even listing those like the four quadrants. So could you please briefly again explain the co four quadrant and like because I was like uh, I was also uh, uh, having difficulties in like uh, validating the what what ideas were important and what what were not because we are on uh, while developing uh, any solutions as an entrepreneur we usually think okay. that the idea that we are working on are important. Yeah, uh, you mean that usually you, the assumptions you think that all of them have the important value? Yes? yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, just remind yourself that there are, when you are uh, writing down your assumptions, it could be different sorts of assumptions as we, we have described you. You have to divide them at least to the, these three, based on these three lenses, from a desirability approach, from a viability approach, or from a people approach, from a business approach, and from a technical or engineering or also feasibility approach. And uh, there are a lot of assumptions that you have, and you know that it is a already approved or validated assumptions. So it is, uh, they are already known. But you have unknown also uh, assumptions that you have to do different sorts of uh, sort of experimentation and research in order to validate or reject them. But they are also under direction for, for evaluation, evaluating uh, uh, an assumption, which is based on the un, uh, importance level of your assumptions. Some of your assumptions that you have, if you reject them if in the process you find that it is not approved, it is not validated and you have to reject them, you have to completely change your direction or even your problem. So, and relatively your solution. So in that sense, they are going to become much more important. But if let's say that, uh, that you are developing a agriculture solution and uh, let's say that that one of the problems is the that assumptions that you have is that that uh, people uh, the, the your audience is less uh, educated from a 
IT point of view, digital, dig, digital usage point of view, uh, there are also, if it, it is not validated and you, you found out that, that, okay, you have to reject this assumption, uh, it is not going to completely push you to reject your main idea, your main problem. So they are important, but they are less important. We are not talking completely about unimportant assumption because if it was 100% unimportant, in that case, you, should re uh, you shouldn't even consider that. But you, if you have considered that, at least they have a level of importance. But you, if you, you, you need to compare, comparably uh, define the importance of assumptions compared to each other, not compared to a, another base, another unit, just compared to each other. Which one is the most important? which was, is a little bit less important than the previous one, and that is the structure, actually. Did I answer your question, Shishir? Uh, uh, yeah, and what about the, the, uh, like the unimportant uh, uh, assumptions uh, like that are unknown? Like, how do we uh, like, uh, know? Because at first thing is like those assumptions that we are making are, are yeah, yeah. like unknown and like it's not even important. Okay, okay. let me go back to this, the previous slides, the slides that I had one moment, please. Let me share with you this slide. Do you see my shared screen? No. Mm -hmm. What about now? Yes. In this diagram on the left side, as you see, uh, uh, there are plenty of assumptions on the other three quarters of this map. Actually, we have one part on the left top side, we have important uh, assumptions, but which are also known, okay? If they are known, there is no need to uh, do extra research or extra uh, experiment in order to validate or this, the, the reject them. We have this part, which is the lower or bottom left side, uh, they are the, we suggested that you, you have to defer any kind of commitment to them, okay? And we have the right bottom side also, which are unimportant uh, assumptions, but they are unknown. If you have already validated your leap of faith assumptions, and if you have time, it will be great to also validate this part of the, this section of the mapped assumptions. Those who are unknown, but they are less important than the leap of faith assumptions. Yes, you have to do that if you have time, but they are not uh, the, in the first priority for you. The first priority is leap of faith assumptions. Did I answer your question, Shisha? Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. I got you now. Okay. So uh, let's move to our. Any other questions, guys? or any suggestion? Okay, let's start uh, today's session. 
which is the second part of design thinking. Actually, as I mentioned previously, design thinking is just an approach that you can use basically in, uh, in your process in order to make your uh, solutions much more creative, to approach your solutions create more creatively. So I would like to start today's session with a video actually. Let's watch this video and then I will, we will discuss the remaining part of the session. Design thinking is an approach to creative problem solving. It's a human-centered path to innovation. Hello, I'm David Kelly. I'm happy we're here to explore design thinking with IDEO. You know, so many people don't think of themselves as creative, but I think that's wrong. Everybody's creative. And that's one of the reasons we teach design thinking, because we think that knowing this kind of approach can unlock your creativity and make you feel capable of coming up with routinely wonderful ideas. Design Thinking starts with simple. It's about putting human needs at the center of all we do. It's about simple mindset shifts and new ways of looking at problems from empathy to inspiration. For an idea to be both successful and meaningful, we use three lenses to bring it into focus. Desirability, feasibility, and viability. This ensures we're creating something that makes people's lives better but that's also feasible to produce and make good business sense. There are many different phases of design thinking. We find a template to teach it in the minimum time, but in some cases, it's more like this. Design thinking unfolds from configured events to the back and forth process of creation. Some take much longer than others to learn them. You need to try it out for yourself. The skills and mindsets of design thinking can help you tackle your biggest challenge and build your creative competence. Once you put it into practice and make it your own, who knows what important problem. Uh, sorry, have. please, can you increase the volume? The volume is kind of low. You didn't hear? Yes, kind of. Kind of. Uh, shall I repeat? Yes, the, the volume play? is low. Yes, yes, please repeat it. Let me, 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 let me uh, check uh, the structure. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, the problem is maybe here. Okay. Just please remind me if you have problems in, in the chat box. Hello, I'm Kelly. I'm happy you're here to explore the design thing. You know, many people don't think of themselves as creative, but I think everybody is creative. And that's one of the reasons we teach design thing, because we think that knowing this kind of approach can unlock creativity. Both successful and meaningful, 
we use three lenses to bring it into focus. Desirability, feasibility, and viability. This ensures we're creating something that makes people's lives better, but that's also feasible to produce and makes good business sense. There are many different phases of design thinking. We find it helpful to teach it in a linear way, but in practice, it's more like this. Design thinking unfolds in iterative loops, moving back and forth across phases, some taking much longer than others. To learn it, you need to try it out for yourself. The skills and mindsets of design thinking can help you tackle your biggest challenges and build your creative confidence. Once you put it into practice and make it your own, who knows what important problems you might solve. So, uh, do you have my voice? Yes. Okay, okay. So, uh, this video has been prepared by IDEO University, actually IDEO-U. As I uh, mentioned pre in our previous session, IDEO is one of the prominent uh, players in the field of design thinking. They are uh, one of the uh, actually uh, most innovative companies in the world and they are uh, developing different solutions starting from the product solutions to service solutions to uh, uh, even uh, social solutions across the globe. They are quite uh, active in, uh, they, they are originally from uh, San Francisco Bay Area and uh, currently they they are working uh, across the globe they have different uh, branches across the globe and they are quite active ac actually for those who, from you who have uh, joined us from africa they are very active in africa uh, they have uh, different uh, initiatives there so i would suggest to visit their website uh, actually if you are in interested in design thinking you can also visit IDEO U or IDEO University but uh, I as a kind of starting point for today's session I would like to if, if you can remind me what was the basic two, the two basic uh, concepts that you have been intro introduced during our previous se session relating to design thinking. What was the main two concepts there? Actually, we had two concepts during the previous session. Would you remind me or reiterate that? Probably assumptions and hypotheses. Okay. <laughs> No, that was the exercise. Before that, we had, we, as an introduction, you learned what is the design thinking and what was the design thinking, actually. Actually, you, just a few seconds ago, you have, you, we repeatedly uh, watched the, the same idea here in, in the video. Um, well, That's the design thinking. Okay, Liana, I'm hearing you. Yes, uh, it's about people, uh, creative people and uh, analytical thinking, strategic people, yeah? Okay, that, that was one point, yes, actually. That was the, the skill. Thinkers, yes, switch, but... The skill to switch easily from, uh, as, as I mentioned uh, in our previous session, from left brain to right brain, or, or so-called so -called from uh, strategic thinking to creative thinking, from cr critical thinking to, uh, let's say, uh, much more intuitive thinking and vice versa. And that's very much important, that the switching between two uh, modes of thinking is very much important very much important please consider that and the second one was these three main lenses in design thinking that oh. you have to approach 
a solution from diff three different lenses, from the people lens, which we called as desirability, from the business, business lens, which we called as viability, viability, and from the um, technology, technology yeah, yeah, which was basically feasibility. Yeah, yeah. So we learned basically two main ideas in design thinking. And today I want to move to another uh, part of the design thinking in order to uh, uh, introduce you with the major characteristics of design thinkers mindset. Because basically what differentiates a kind of design thinker or so-called designer from other people is the mindset. And in order to understand what kind of um, a mindset does a design thinker has, uh, we have to uh, consider a lot of characteristics. And actually during my uh, research during the last 10 years, actually 10 years or more than 10 years, actually starting from 2008, I, I started my research in design thinking. And it was interesting that, that up to now I have discovered more than 15 major characteristics or mindset traits in designers which uh, can use which is uh, which can help uh, people who do not have these characteristics to approach questions or problems or solutions much more creatively but today we are going to focus just on major six major mindset characteristics in design thinkers. So we are going to start with the, the first major D mindset, which is showing, don't telling. Design thinkers approach is that, that instead of telling that uh, what you are going to do at, or what you are thinking or what you are planning, just show it, that is very much important. And that is the reason that usually uh, when you imagine a, a person as a, as a designer, you usually imagine him or her with a pen in, in his or her hand and drawing something. Visualization is very much important in design thinking. And as you see here in this quote from Jean Litka, a professor in Darden Graduate School of Business Administration, she has written a very interesting book on design thinking called Designing for Growth, as you he see here. Visualization is an approach for identifying, organizing, and communicating in ways that usually access right brains thinking while decreasing our dependency on left brain media, such as numbers. So by using visualization, when you start visualizing in your processes, you force your mind to switch to much more creative mode instead of thinking much more strategically or much more uh, critically. So visualization is a way to decrease our dependency from left brain and focus much more on our right brain. And that's very much important for designers. And that is the reason that usually when you imagine designers, you usually imagine that designers you are people who are drawing, who are visualizing. That is the major reason for that. And actually, as you see here, uh, this is the initial sketches by a very famous designer for a product that you will see now. This product is one of the most famous uh, last century's most famous designed pro pro products 
created in 90s, uh, 1990s, actually previ uh, uh, previous uh, century, uh, by Philip Stark, a French designer. As you see, it's a, it, it, the product is called Juicy Salif. Uh, it's a squeezer, actually. Okay, juice, juice, juicer, as, as we can uh, explain. Uh, uh, and as you see in the left side on the actually paper that he has started the sketches of the product, you see that how he started to think. Let's say maybe he, he was eating a uh, let's say seafood so as you can imagine he, uh, he has been in uh, uh, the Capri Island eating uh, seafood uh, some sort of seafood and he was imagining about uh, how we, we, he can use the forms of seafood uh, in creating a product and he, he had come up with this idea of Juicy Salif, which is very successful, which has become very successful throughout the globe. And he has been, it has been uh, produced or manufactured by Alessi, a very famous Italian company in 1990s. So as you see here, that visualization is a very important tool which gives you the creative, uh, which forces your creative juices to flow. And that's very much important. And that is the reason that usually in design thinking, when we suggest people to start writing their ideas, we suggest them to draw their ideas, even though Maybe they have no idea, they have no previous skills in drawing, they are not designers. But drawing your ideas, you, you can ex exercise it yourself. When you start drawing your ideas, in instead of writing your ideas, you become much more creative when, uh, compared to when you are writing your ideas. So please consider this major mindset. Second group of my actually major mindsets in design thinking is the embracing experimentation. Designers are much more inclined uh, to embrace experiments and that's very much important and it is much more important for you also from an entrepreneurship point of view, because a lean startup is, is also basically based on experimentation. So one of the major uh, examples of uh, experimentation in design thinking is prototyping. Actually, the term prototyping with this new intonation and with this new meaning in word has derived from design. And what does it mean prototyping? As you see here from Alexander Osterwalder, I, I hope you have read at least or have had uh, uh, overlooked uh, his uh, book on business model innovation. Have you heard of this business model generation book? Yes? Has somebody read this book? Alexander Ostolwarder's Business Model Generation, written yes. in 2010. Yes, I've gone through it. So, so I, I would suggest to do that. That's good. Uh, yes, yes, yes. That, that's very important book, actually. I would suggest to do that because you are going to build a venture and it is one of the basic requirements for starting an entrepreneurship course. So please find 
the business model innovation uh, or, or generation book or at least visit strategizer website i i'm writing here strategizer website that's their website actually i would suggest to look through that and what is important that Osterwalder, uh, who is a Swiss guy actually from Switzerland, uh, he has created this book also, co created actually this book with the help of uh, uh, a lot of people actually. And uh, the idea was that, that even that book has been prototyped more than 100 times. And it's very important to consider prototyping. Uh, and as he explains here, he is uh, in the design profession, prototypes do play a role in pre-implementation visualization and testing. So it is a kind of visualization tool. But they also play another very important role, which is questioning. That's very much important. When you create a prototype for a product, either it could be a tangible product or, or a service prototyping is, is a tool for sharing your ideas to start questioning uh, to visualizing your ideas and even to to testing your ideas so prototyping is very much important and as you see here in the next slide for example in this picture uh, you see a, a team working on a prototype uh, and what is important that you don't need extra equipment extra skills in order to do the prototyping any tangible that lets us explore an idea evaluating that push it forward is actually a prototype. Uh, I would add something, let's say on the left side, you see a kind of prototype. Can you imagine it's the prototype of what kind of business the, on the left side? Do you have any idea which, what kind of business is this? Shishir, do you have any suggestion? Liana? Um, maybe any other uh, maybe they are creating a doll it's a very famous business actually uh, it's about social uh, profile it's about uh, so social me yeah yeah, yeah. yeah social but, but what what is it is the prototype of facebook actually facebook okay <laughs> Yeah, 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 it's the pro prototype of Facebook. So even Facebook has started like this. So please consider that prototyping is very much important. As you see here, another example from radio in, in the, the third uh, photo that we have here is it's a kind of uh, surgery gun for brain surgery they have created the brain surgery gun prototype as you see here from a very ordinary products in their uh, during the prototyping process so you don't need extra special equipment to do the prototyping you can do prototyping from actually you can create your prototypes from nothing and that is very much important and Prototyping is very important in design thinking, actually. And if you have any question, please raise your hand and uh, or even uh, suggest your question or comment, anything. I will okay, be happy. Please, can you and... explain that? Can you explain what you say? You say you can create your prototype from nothing as how? Yeah, can you explain yeah. it for that? Yeah, yeah, yes. Let's consider that you are prototyping a kind of service. Okay. Uh, let's say you are prototyping an agricultural service. Uh, 
Okay. okay. In that case, you can either prototype the service, let's say based uh, like uh, as a kind of storyboarding that, uh, creating different storyboards showing that in the, your different sta stages of your service, let's say approaching the customer, starting conversation with uh, customer, signing the contract with cost customer, uh, different stages of your service. It could be kind of story uh, boarding storyboard creation or you can even role play that you can even play the the idea that you have in your mind as as you you will do in a kind of theater so you can play that role you can you 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 let's say you have five people in your team each one of you can uh, take one role and you can play that role and during that process you will start thinking much more deeply and you, you can you will start inquiring or questioning your way of approach so that is also a kind of uh, prototyping so everything that makes your idea tangible in a way it shouldn't be as a product. It could be just, just any kind of approach that make your idea tangible. And you, through that tangible idea, you can share your idea with others. It will help you to evaluate your idea, to share your idea, to question your idea, and to test your idea. So we call all of them totally as prototype did i answer your question yes you did okay any other question uh yeah what about or, um, uh, yes i'm what about yeah, hardware I'm, products uh, what you're talking about hardware products. yeah yeah about yeah the yeah products that are software products and have uh, ui but if we are uh, developing something that is uh, physical yeah in that case it's much more easier you can create a very rough uh, model of very rough model of the uh, let me show the previous slide here you are watching actually a hardware products prototype as you see here it's a hardware product the the next one the facebook is a software product the third one is a, again a hardware product prototype so it's very easy to do that you can create because uh, especially when you have a hardware product you want to test the interaction of your audience with that hardware so you can create something tangible literally tangible in this case something okay, that i sorry, can what, touch what if the main client price is between uh, uh, big businesses and not individuals so I even think in, in that this case, case e e even in that case in, in the initial stage you can create a rough prototype uh, in prototyping we have a, a high resolution prototypes and low resolution prototypes let's say in this case that this uh, surgery gun this is the low uh, resolution prototype it's a very rough prototype in the later stage of this prototype this product development process they created different sorts of high resolution prototypes and when they approached during this process to different in different stage to their customers and as you see here even in this case it is a b2b uh, product so in that case they can start using their a little bit high resolution prototypes with their b2b audience i can i understand your concern but please don't think that even the the b2b businesses uh, 
you you can just extract uh, their feedback even with a low uh, resolution prototype but definitely you are going to develop gradually higher resolution pro prototypes and sharing them with your audiences also okay did i answer your question ara yeah thanks a lot yes okay any other questions? Sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. Please, can you use a case, um, the um, hydroponics um, system as a case scenario? Sorry? Hydroponic system. Yeah. Automate as, a, um, as an example for prototype. Uh, yes, you, you can do that. But there is no... Uh, do you want me to do that as an example? Yes, I didn't. please. Uh, let's say that, that, would you remind me about your basics of your idea? Um, yes, um, more like um, create, uh, we are developing an automated hydroponic system that farmers, that can help farmers control their nutrients and also growth per, um, parameters and they control the environment. Okay, in the, uh, in that case, you you can uh, do the first uh, prototyping through, uh, let's say, uh, tell role playing or storyboarding. Actually, you can create the different storyboarding. Do you know the storyboard? The idea of storyboarding. Have you seen the comic strips? Do you have the idea of comic strips? Yes. Usually in comic strips, you have different uh, important uh, moments shared with you with, uh, let's say, the, some uh, also communication there. So you can create the comic strip of your uh, process. Let's say how you are going to approach your uh, audience. Okay, let's say that you have sold me your service. What I am going to receive? How am I, am, am I, I am going to understand that your system is working? So all of them could be in different uh, storyboards. You can create different storyboards explaining that in this storyboard, for example, me as a uh, customer, what am I doing here? And what is the touch point with your product, with your service? And if we, I am going to have a, some sort of problem, whom I am going to approach, how I am going to raise issue, am I going to call you, I'm going, am I going to write you, am I going to send a message, it, it can happen basically from a starting point, from a storyboarding, or even doing a role-playing example. Uh, do you have, how many people do you have in your team? Um, we are three. Three. So you, uh, you can start doing this exercise based basically with this idea that, that one of you uh, could become the, uh, your company as, as the company, as, as an organization. One could be your, your end user and one could be your product. So you can play the role and in order to understand that, what is missing there and what is extra or what is interesting, uh, uh, you will understand that if you start the exercise. So I would suggest to do that definitely. Role playing is very much interesting because you you can uh, you, you I'm sure you you can, for for now you cannot imagine how much can you discover during that process yourself and at the later stage when you define a little bit more of your different stage you can role play in front of your your potential 
audience in order to get feedback from him or her. So it will be quite helpful for you. Did I answer your question also? Yes. Or, or your request? Yes, okay. it did. Thanks so much. Let's move. Okay. Let's move forward and uh, let's talk about a very important uh, mindset in design thinkers, which is human centricity. Human centricity is very much imp important. And how designers uh, approach this mindset is through a kind of quality called, which we call it empathy, empathizing. Empathizing is very, very important uh, uh, quality in designers. And you can learn a lot through empathizing with your audience. Because usually we are inclined to think that as an entrepreneur, as a technical person, as a business person, I understand better than my client. What do they need? But as I mentioned previously, the majority of entrepreneurship venture, entrepreneurial ventures fail not because of their teams, not because of their ideas, their solutions, not because of their the, the financial issues, but the majority of them, 42% of them actually, based on a recent research, 42% of them fail just because they couldn't understand their audience in depth as much as it, it is needed. So empathizing is very much important quality. And through empathizing, you put yourself in the shoes of your audience and approach the question from their perspective. And that's very much important. And as you see here, uh, a very important uh, quote from Tom and D David Kelly, the founders of IDEO, empathy means challenging your preconceived ideas and setting aside your sense of what you think is true just in order to learn what actually is true. There is another very important book related to design thinking from the founders of IDEO, The Creative Confidence. I would suggest to read that. It's a very easy reading book and it's very engaging and engaging and exciting book I would suggest to Google if you uh, will find time please do this uh, empathizing is very much important from a designer's point, point of view and it, there are a lot of uh, exercises uh, unfortunately because of our uh, limited time we cannot do that but I would suggest to uh, Put yourself in your, the shoes of your audience, your real audience. Either it is a company, in the case of B2B businesses, or it's an end user. Put yourself in their shoes and approach to your problem from their point of view without having any preconceived ideas. Without having a, a, a kind, any kind of prejudice. That's very much important. Uh, and the fourth major mindset in designers or design thinkers is bias toward action. As you remember, usually in business approach, the classic or traditional business approach, everything should be planned. But from a modern approach, from the approach of lean startup and also from a design thinking point of view, bias toward action is very much important. Instead of just planning, 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 and then when we have a 
well articulated and well elaborated plan we uh, we are ready to move into implementation the idea in design thinking is that just do the implementation parallel to doing the planning and that is very much important and as you see here from a uh, quote from nigel cross one of the also very famous people who are Oh, theoricians actually, theoricians in the field of design thinking, the activity of sketching, drawing, or modeling provides some, some of the circumstances by which a designer put him or herself into the design situation. And what is important here is that he or she engaged with the exploration of the problem parallel to its solution and that's very much important because from a design thinking point of view you don't accept your problem as it is from the starting point because during the process you have to consider that sometimes your problems have to be changed must change and it is the same even in the lean startup because if you have a problem at the starting point of your uh, starting a startup uh, in lean startups ap approach you have to be ready to pivot not only once but even more than 100 times during the lean startup process and in order to do that, you have to consider that problem and solution is going to be explored and uh, discovered during this process. And what is important is the process, the process of learning by doing, not just planning and then doing, learning by doing. And that's very much important issue. And another very important mindset in design thinking is the radical collaboration. When we are talking about design thinking, we are not talking about designers working together or engineers working together or business people working together. We are talking about a multidisciplinary, multicultural, multi-background people working together and working radically together and what is important here is that design thinking is working as a glue that sticks different di dimensions of these multidisciplinary groups and multidisciplinary collaboration to each other and as you see here in the definition of this school uh, in parentheses, let me uh, introduce you to the idea of this school. This school, which is located in Stanford University, is the only design school in the world who is not educating designers. This school's activity is just focused on teaching design thinking to non-design professionals so in the design school of the school of stanford people from different colleges or schools join this school to learn design thinking and to work in multidisciplinary and multicultural collaboration and as you see here we believe having designers in the mix is the key, success, key to success in multidisciplinary collaborations and critical to uncovering unexplored areas of innovations. In our experience, design thinking is the glue that holds these kinds of communities together and make them successful. And I would suggest you also to include, in, consider including designers in your team if you don't have still consider to do that because it will be much more helpful in the process of 
building uh, your venture and building your solution. So radical co collaboration and using design as a glue is very much important also from a design thinking point of view. So the last but not least, because as I mentioned, I have uh, find more than 50 special specialty mindset in design thinkers, uh, but we, we are today focusing just on six major ones. And the last one is being mindful of process. And what does it mean, mindful of process? Let me explain a little bit more. Usually, when you imagine a designer what working on a design, what do you imagine in your mind? Can somebody articulate his or her imagination of a design process? What is a design process? Do you have any idea? Maybe it's about listen, create, show, try, and again, listen, create, show, try. Okay, that's, a, that's an interesting approach. Yeah, why not? Any other idea? Any other suggestion? Angelica, do you want to add something? Okay. Usually, because designers have this approach that they, as I mentioned previously in our previous uh, session, that they are switching very easily from left to side, right to left side of their brains, so-called right brain, left brain. It's very difficult to understand what is the process of design usually. And sometimes it, uh, people think that it's an utter enigma, but it's not like that. Actually, there is a process of design thinking. There are plenty of different articulations related to design thinking processes you can find online actually. But what I am using here is the D schools articulated design thinking process. That as you see here, we have uh, not a linear process because design thinking I want to emphasize is an iterative is an iterative process, meaning that when you move from one mode to another mode, there is no uh, necess necessity to move to the third point unless you are sure that you have done something good, and you can return back and you start from the scratch. So let us see what is the main phases of the design thinking process. Design thinking process is not starting from the problem. It's starting from empathizing. Designers put themselves in the shoes of their audience in order to understand what kind of problems exists from their approach. And then after empathizing and doing the research, ethnographic, in-depth, or qualitative research, they define the problem. So if, even if they have an initial problem as a starting point, they used to start with empathizing and then defining the problem. And in the third phase is the most famous part of the design thinking, the ideation process, the creativity process, the phase that you create a lot of solutions. And then from that solutions mix, you create the prototype. 
in order to question, in order to make it tangible, in order to share it e easily with others. And when you have the prototype, you can test it. But in any mode of this design thinking process, you can, if you, I, uh, let's say in the ideation phase, if you did a lot of ideation and you didn't reach to your desired solution, you can return back to your, to your empathizing phase and start from empathizing and then defining an ideation. It's not a linear process as you see, it's a iterative process and you can return back to your starting point. Do you have any questions up to now? Any questions, any suggestions, any opinions? So as you see here in this process, it is very similar to lean, lean startup process. Because from in the lean startup process, as you have, I, I hope you have heard already that, that we start from customer discovery. Empathizing is the same as the customer di discovery. And when you have the customer discovery phase and you redefine your problem, it's the, when you validated your problem and articulated your problem, you start the prototype ideation process. And then after finishing the ideation process, you do the prototyping and finally testing. And in any stage, you can pivot your process. Any questions here? So. I have a, I have a, question um, okay will this uh, process remain same in almost all the fields the? in all the fields supposing defense personnel are designing uh, some prototype yes 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 it is the same agriculture yes, it is, is also same. doing the same in, it in is the same if you are doing agriculture yeah, it's, it's the same. Uh, either you are doing an agricultural project or you are do doing a design project, you are doing a community project, problems. Uh, it is a process for creative solution finding for any sort of problem. All right. Okay. Thank you. So up to now we learned six major mindsets in designers. The first one was visualizing, visualization. The second one was uh, prototyping. The third one was, as you see, was the, let me, uh, experimentation as our prototyping human centricity, which is the, uh, we learned about empathizing, bias toward action or doing, learning by doing radical collaborations or acting as a glue. And we learned also about uh, process, mindfulness about process, that, that there is a kind of process in design thinking. Okay? So, what we are going to do now as a last stage in our two sessions, we are going to be introduced to one very important and useful and impactful tool in design thinking. As you remember, I mentioned that visualization and empathizing is our two major mindset in design thinking. So one of the tools that design thinkers use is persona creation. And what does it mean, a persona? In order to understand a persona, let's have a very initial or basic definition of persona. Personas are fictional characters 
created based on the insights that we have extracted from our exploratory research. When we finish our research in our audience, we extracted different insights from them. We create a fictional character in order to exemplify certain attributes of our potential audience and in order to enhance ability to build an, an empathetic understanding of them. So basically it's based on two of main mindset characteristics of design thinkers. So Personals are very much important in design thinking. And what I want to introduce to you is the well, how we can create personas and what is the purpose of the persona. Usually when designers, let's say, design a solution for their audience, in order to empathize is make it easier to empathize with their audience because usually let's say you are designing uh, let's say i'm designing a, a, a iphone okay i'm in the design team of iphone and i'm designing a smartphone okay when i'm designing a smartphone every time i'm designing a smartphone it's very difficult to imagine that millions of people are going to use this gadget with different approaches, with different backgrounds, with different back mindsets. But it will be easier for me if I have a kind of fictional character in my mind, which exemplifies certain attributes of my larger audience, and through that, enhancing my ability to build a kind of empathy with them. It's very much easier for me as a designer to design this phone for somebody, let's say, called George, whom I know, whom I can imagine, whom I can uh, imagine I can connect easily with him or her. So in that sense, we usually create personas. And as you see here in Will, William Hudson's uh, quote, our brains are wired to empathize with individuals rather than groups. So it's very much easier, let's say, to empathize with one person, even if it is an imaginative person, rather than a group. It will be very difficult, let's say, to uh, design a solution for farmers aged 25 to 36 who are living in Africa, in northern, north, south, south north, sorry, northeastern part of Africa. Uh, who are uh, who have small uh, knowledge of modern uh, technologic approach to agriculture so it will be very difficult to consider all of these people we could have let's say one million audience there but is it easy to understand to empathize with all of them it's not easy. So in order to do that, usually from a design thinking point of view, you create a kind of persona that will in, include the major, the dominant characteristics that you can imagine in these people. And so it's easier to empathize with individuals compared to groups. And personas are representations of our extreme users who represent the goals 
the behaviors and motivations of our real users. So when we do the research, we gather the different goals that our different users have, the behaviors that our different users we have discovered in them, the different motivations that our different users could have, and through that, they promote empathy by allowing us to focus on individuals rather than groups. So how can we create personas? In order to do that, I want to show you one example. Do you know Spotify as a business, digital business? The music provider online music streaming solution, sorry. Yeah? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is the one of the examples of uh, personas created for Spotify. As you see, in order to create a persona, you need to consider to even to have a picture of him or her. It makes the persona much more tangible and interesting and something that you can easier connect with her or with him. So here we have Rebecca. The definition is the casual audio file. You have here the age, the uh, occupation, the education, the marital status, uh, location, where she lives. She's she, single, she has a bachelor de de degree. Uh, her occupation is front end developer. Online locations, when she she's working or using the online locations, She's online on war in during the work time or mobile time. What kind of computers do does she will use? iPhone or MacBook for Pro? Internet usage? How many hours do does she use uh, uh, internet? Eight to nine hours. Compared here, we have a uh, gauge as you see. Uh, technophobe or tech whiz, which one is she's a tech whiz, she's a tech knowledgeable person in uh, technical point of view, from a technical point of view. Uh, what kind of music, the, how does she hear music from CDs or music streaming? As you see, she's much more inclined to streaming. Casual listener or hard, hardcore geek, she's a casual listener, she's not a hardcore geek. As you see in the middle uh, column, music is, uh, there is a short description about Rebecca. There is a definition, oh sorry. Let's return to Rebecca's. As you see here the, in the center part, we have how will Rebecca interact with Spotify. The influencers on Rebecca, we, they have actually defined the influencers on Rebecca. Uh, and we have Rebecca's situation, the goals, the motivations that Rebecca have, the keyboard that describes Rebecca's uh, uh, relationship with music. And there is a very interesting short story about Rebecca. So if you are a top engineer at Spotify, if you are a designer in Spotify, if you are a this, uh, project manager in this, this Spotify, when you know a Rebecca and other people, it will be very much easier to create a solution that fits Rebecca, that fits George and people whom we have given a kind of persona. 
In the next slide, you will see another type of personas for two personas and you have, you can define, let's say up to five personas for your uh, business based on the, your needs. There are some uh, businesses who have just one personas or two personas, but there are also people, businesses who need um, many personas, uh, as many as five. As you see here, we have another example. Uh, we have a Kyla who, who is a planner. There is a, as you see, there is no strict structure for the, uh, let's say, template of uh, presenting the persona. But as you see here, we have two personas for just one business, Kyla and Drew, planner and influencer. So what we are going to do as an exercise, and I, I, hopefully I will give you uh, definitely, I will give you actually uh, feedback related to your created personas. I'm going to share with you a persona canvas, a very basic persona canvas. In order to create your persona, just please consider, please consider that even, even if you, you have a B2B business, if you are going to approach businesses your, your audience is from businesses not the end user but you have to develop personas for your business audience in that case if you have a business audience business is not going to be the the business itself is not going to be your persona because person is a person. So who is going to be the, your persona in the business? The main decision makers and influencers inside that business could become your audience. Let's say you are developing a solution for a ministry of agriculture in your country. So your audience in your business could be the minister of agriculture or the person in charge of the uh, innovation in agriculture, promoting innovation in agriculture, uh, the person in charge of uh, relationship between different uh, agricultural uh, initiatives could be your... So in any case, your person is a person, not a company. And it will be easier to consider if your audience is going to be a kind of B2C, if you are a B2C solution provider. And if you are also a B2G, B2B or B2C, in any case, you need to define your person and your persona is a person, please consider that. And as you see in your, the canvas that I have shared with you, uh, it will be easy, much more uh, engaging if you add photos and appearance related to your persona. It definitely it is a fiction, fictional character. So you can choose photos from online photo uh, banks or Google. Uh, photos or pictures, you can just find unrelated people's photos and you can use as a kind of engaging photo in order to show the appearance of your persona. So the central part of the, your, uh, let me, Sorry, I, I'm just wondering. Oh, okay. Okay. So in the central part of your canvas, you see the needs. 
you have to define the main need or yeah, the main problem of your uh, persona here. You have to create name and it is very much interesting. You have to give a name to your audience in order to make it uh, as real as possible and also define his or her role. He's a farmer, he's a educator, he's a, uh, she's a, let's say, a homeowner, she's a planner, and you can add as much as possible personal details from her or him. And on the right side of your canvas, you have positive trends and negative trends on the left side. Positive trends are trends who can help your audience in order to solve his or her problems. Let's say sometimes the positive trends, uh, sometimes for some of you, one of the major negative trends is this COVID and pandemia situation could be a kind of negative trend or it could be also a tra positive trend re com compared to your idea. And opportunities and positive events you have to write on the right side. And your audiences, your, your personas hopes for the future and fears from the future also on the left side and headaches and daily problems, and problems on the left side. What I need you to do is to develop at least one because certainly you could have more than one personas. You, you need more than maybe you need, you will need more than one personas in your, for your business or venture, but at least please develop as an exercise in order to learn. And when you, uh, as an exercise, develop one persona for your business and uh, do it as an assignment. And during the process, you can use your personas and you can revise your personas because uh, as you go through your process of developing your business, you will find different strangers uh, stay in different stages that you will need to redefine your personas. There is no problem with doing that. But in the initial stage, you have to define your personas. And I'm sure that it will help you a lot. Either you are developing a business from a project management point of view, from a technical point of view, from a design point of view, or even from a management point of view, in either side, it will help you to empathize with your audience and to develop appropriate solution for your audience. So what do you need to do next for, for as an assignment before your next session, which is not related to design thinking, is this. The assignment brief is this. Based on an initial exploratory research, identify two of your major target audience segments and develop one persona per each segment. I'm sure that you have done a lot, a little bit at least, exploratory research to, uh, in order to identify how many segments do you have as an audience. So per each segment, please, per two of your segments, let's say that your business have five segment aud audience, you, you please consider just two of them at least and develop uh, personas for each based on that canvas that I have shared with you. And please send your personas to my email or as we are usually doing using that, 
to the, to the Slack account, and I will definitely give you feedback and answer your questions. And please approach me also before doing that exercise if you have any sort of question. I'm ready to hear, hear your questions or any uh, comments and feedback also. Uh, uh, I have a question. Okay, Suti, I hear. Uh, um, when doing this exercise, how do we ensure that we empathize correctly or we have the same uh, perception as our audience? Or is it that, uh, uh, is it that, how do we ensure that we are uh, uh, doing this um, estimation correctly? Uh, like it might go completely opposite uh, or our audi audience might perceive it uh, completely opposite so how do we ensure that or is it like uh, uh, is it like we, uh, that uh, that our feeling that yes this is the right uh, this is right or how do we ensure that that's a good question actually uh how we can ensure that is the, the we uh, it, it starts with the way and the approach that we are uh, researching or, or understanding our audience uh, from the starting point let's say that you uh, you want to create a solution for farmers in certain area so the initial idea is to you you have to approach them. You have to approach them and you have to understand as in depth as possible their main concerns, their main ideas, their main behaviors, what they do, what they, how they learn, what they say, what they think, how they feel. That's very much important. And during that process because when we are talking about interviewing our audience it is not just asking questions and recording what did they say you have to un you have to put yourself in their shoes and to start thinking about uh, from, from their point of view and in that case, let's say one of the ways for doing that is to, uh, from uh, it's actually an ethnographic approach. Uh, instead of just asking them what they do and how do they how they do, go and observe them during their processes. Instead of asking them, you can still you can ask them how do they perform their daily tasks. But another approach and much more valuable approach is to observe how do they do their daily tasks. So observation is a very important also way of empathizing with your audience. So there are plenty of ways and basically the majority of them are ethnographic approaches. Let's say uh, if you are researching your uh, farmers, you can spend one day with, with each farmer in order other, to understand their concerns, their problems, without even asking them. You can just watch them, you can just observe them. And that's what very much important. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yes, thank you. Any other question? So, if you don't have any question, still if you will have any question, please raise your question in Slack group. I will definitely answer your questions. Uh, and I, be, I am looking forward, I will share this uh, sorry, I will share this uh, 
uh, canvas with you. Uh, and if you will have any, uh, I will share this, this canvas with you uh, parallel to, in addition to uh, what I'm going to share also with you uh, as the slide deck. Let me share, yes. I'm sh I will share uh, a separate canvas PDF with you. I will share it directly on your Slack group. So please let me know if you you will not be successful to download it. I, I hope it will not happen again. Uh, please complete your personal canvases for two of your groups and send it to the group and I will give you the feedback. Uh, and as a wrap up, I would like to wrap up mentioning that we learned that design thinking is a, a both hemispheres thinking approach. You have to learn switching easily from left brain to right brain. That's very much important. We learned that when we are talking about this in design thinking, we are approaching any question or solution from three main lenses of desirability, viability, or and feasibility from the people side of the story, from the uh, technology side of the story, and also business side of the story. And we learned also that, that uh, we can approach our assumptions and we can map our assumptions based on uh, these triple uh, lenses approach. Today we learned that there are six major mindsets in design. The most important may be from what we are going to use in persona personification is the visualization and uh, empathizing. And we have an exercise to do, which is based on the visualization, because when you are doing this canvas, you are visualizing your persona, and you can, when you have, when you finalize your persona, you can print it out and you can stick it on, on your wall, and you can communicate every day during your process with the, that guy who has a name, has a photo, has a defined certain needs, personal details, is living uh, in a positive and negative trends environment. There he or she has opportunities and positive events, and uh, he or she has headaches and daily problems has some sort of hopes for the future and some sort of fears for the future. So in that case, you are creating a fictional character in order to communicate with him or her much more easily throughout your venture building process. So that's all for today and actually for our design Most thinking that, Jan, conversations. Uh... I would like to thank you from the name of FAST, UNDP, and Agritech Agrara University. So this was an excellent session. I believe the participants gained a lot of knowledge and information and like a food for thought to read more on design thinking and apply it for their businesses and for their lives in general. Uh, guys, please do the assignment and submit it to Slack or you can email to Nujde. It's at your convenience. You already have the teams, so please do persona creation for the ideas of your teams. That's all for today. Uh, Ajahn, thank, thank you. you just, just one one point, please. Sure. Uh, if uh, May I uh, add something? Uh, uh, please feel free to contact me either through our Slack channel group or directly through email. If you will have any question regarding design thinking and its uh, implementation throughout your venture creation process, I will be happy to help you throughout the process. 
please feel free. Uh, uh, our sessions are ended, but it doesn't mean that I, I cannot help you anymore. Even after finalizing your uh, second assignment. 